Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the arts this morning. Um, and through the arts, I'm going to talk a little bit about music and a little bit about jazz music. Jazz music is America's folk music. You invented it. Now, you can tell uh, from listening to me talk that I'm not from Williamsport. <laughs> I'm actually from Alabama. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm from Oxford in England, and I came to Williamsport about five years ago, which means that I have not lived here all my life. And as I came here, the transformations that are taking place in Williamsport and the surrounding area were already underway. They were starting. And uh, as I was uh, sitting up there earlier today, um, thinking about today and listening to the introductions and what it was all about, I started thinking about the community and um, the reactions of the community to the changes that are taking place. And it seems to me that uh, part of the community, at least, is in a state of shock at the moment because the changes have happened so fast and so inevitable. It's like a tsunami that has just swept into the area. And we don't quite know how to deal with it. We're scared of it. But at the same time, we want it. And I was uh, looking at some of the videos on the Williamsport TEDx uh, site last night. And one of them, I, th I believe it referred to how are we going to deal with the period of growth? How many places would like to have that problem? It's like the musicians that say to me, oh, I'm just so busy next month. I'm, I've got a tour, I've got two commissions to write. Yeah, that's great, isn't it? <laughs> or when you go into the restaurant, I'm sorry, we're really busy. <laughs> well, yeah, you want to be busy, right? Or the artist that's got to paint three different uh, works um, as part of a commission, and then they've only got six weeks to complete it. These are actually nice problems to have, but it doesn't make them necessarily easy to deal with. So uh, I was thinking about that and how the arts uh, which are all around us. In fact, on your way in here, you may have noticed there are paintings on the wall there. I wonder, hands up if you noticed those paintings today on the way in. Okay, so the, the arts are all around us, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can tap into those and learn something the from the people that produce this material. So, what the arts can teach us. It's all around us in the city. That's near the bullfrog. It's an evolving work of art, which involves, uh, depicts real people in the community. We also have the William Sports Symphony Orchestra. Um, put your hands up if you've been to a William Sports Symphony concert. Okay. And put your hands up if you've seen the mural. <laughs> okay. The Pajama Factory, uh, a very large facility, uh, just a little bit out of the city center, uh, putting on all kinds of events in the arts, all kinds of uh, art exhibits. Uh, people have studios there. So the arts are all around us here. So I'm talking about uh, music, theater, visual art, poetry, dance. All these things come together to form the arts, and they all have common threads that run between them. My own art form is jazz. I've been a jazz trumpet player longer than I can remember now, which means I'm also a performer. And alongside of that, I'm also an educator. And uh, when I came in this morning, I had an idea of what I was going to say to you at the beginning, and that all changed. And the one thing that jazz musicians do very well is adapt to change very, very quickly. And I'll explain a little bit, about, bit more about that later. But if you can see the connection there between a community that's slightly in shock and a group of musicians that are very used to dealing with change very rapidly and making something really good out of it, maybe we can learn something from these people. Um, I also wanted to talk to you just very briefly about uh, something I got involved in about three years ago called the TAP program. The Teacher-Artist Partnership is uh, something which is being piloted in Pennsylvania through the Pennsylvania Council in the Arts. And um, it does something familiar to us, and then it does something unfamiliar to us. The familiar thing is that it puts artists into schools to work with young people, which is always a good thing. It helps youngsters uh, think creatively. It helps them experience something they haven't experienced before. And then the artist comes in, and then they leave. The unfamiliar thing is that through the TAP program, it puts an artist into a non-arts curricular subject. Physics, math, history, social studies. Any kind of artist. It could be a visual artist. It could be a musician. In my case, I did a residency at Lowell Sock High School working with a history teacher. So for the first time, the arts are coming out of their little area within the arts and going into unfamiliar areas of the arts. And to me, that's a great breakthrough because there's such a huge amount that people everywhere can learn from the arts. I started to think more carefully about that after I did my first residency and saw the benefit for people who are not familiar with the arts getting exposed to it and learning their own subject through the artist. And I started to reflect on my own teaching experiences with students who are trying to learn trumpet, which is my instrument, 
or trying to learn to improvise, or trying to learn a little bit about the history of music, or to try and improve their technique on their instrument. And I realized that way over 50% of my time is spent on behavior change, attitude change, and altering habits. Now, how many of us are not in situations where we need to address all of those things at some point? So I started to realize that I'm teaching musicians something which is really non-musical. It actually ties in very well with, with the previous speaker we had here, who was talking about thought processes. And I thought, why am I only teaching musicians? Well, now I've got the opportunity to go and work with a history teacher and teach them some of these things. And then I started to think of it in a wider context, which I'm going to get to in a moment. So what do the arts mean to you? Is it entertainment? Put your hands up if you've been to a, an, some kind of arts event in the last month. Now put your hands up if it was just for relaxing, it was just something else to do. And put your hands up if you actually really had an appreciation for the art form and wanted to know more about it. Okay, well that's a good sign. <laughs> Is it a hobby or a pastime? Now put your hands up if you have played a musical instrument or painted a picture or been in a play or danced at some point in your life. Okay, that's a pretty impressive show of hands. Has anyone written a poem here? Or a short story? Or a play? So most of us here have been involved in some kind of creative process in our lives. We were either had to do it because we were in school, or maybe we wanted to do it. So that shows us that it has touched all of us in some way or another, even if we don't choose it as our profession. For some people, the arts are an escape. Put your hands up if it makes you better to, feel, to listen to some music. It changes your mood or going to, some, to see a play or a production in a venue like this. So for some of us, it's just an escape. For some people, it's a costly indulgence. It's expensive. We can't afford this. The arts get hit very, very hard when times are bad, economically. They're the first to go. Oh, we don't need the band. Or, oh, we can do without the art teacher. We don't really need that. That's just an add-on. It's something. The question really is, can you afford not to have it? because sometimes we don't realize, until it's not there, the value of it. How many people are not interested in the arts at all? Surprisingly enough, that's often the response. Most people kind of take it for granted that it's always going to be there. Looks like my, uh, oh, here we go. So what would the world be like without the arts? Something like that, I think. A really rather a dull place. Not a place where, where, where we really want to be. So the arts have a capacity to reach us in ways that go beyond just appreciating it, or even just playing an instrument, or painting a picture. There are processes that take place behind the scenes which we can learn from. So it goes way, way beyond just a cultural identity thing, or an entertainment thing, or a feel-good factor. This is a quote, and I'm sorry if this is a little small, but you can probably see it quite well. I just want you to take one moment to read that. I'm going to pause for a moment and ask you to read that quote. So this quote really uh, encapsulates what I was feeling when I was sitting up there about two hours ago, that, oh, I want to make some changes. I've seen the atmosphere here, I've seen the audience, I've seen some of the themes that are starting to emerge. Let's change it. Now, has Williamsport been able to do that in response to the growth in the, with the gas industry coming in, and the hospital building, and coals coming in, and now the conference, has Williamsport been able to react that fast? No, of course not. Um, it's a huge shift for people who've been here all their lives. It's a huge cultural shift, it's a workforce shift. Uh, you'll read in the Gazette, there's lots of people complaining about things, oh, we don't want this, we don't want that. Some of it maybe, maybe is founded, some of it is not founded. But the jazz musician, the improv actor, lives in that world 24 hours, seven days a week. So it's very easy for us to adapt, to change. Not that the change is necessarily all we want. We can be performing in a group or with other musicians playing and improvising, and sometimes things happen within the group that, ah, that's not quite what I wanted to hear then, but you would never know that because we deal with it in a creative way. Steve Jobs agreed with this. He was a great advocate of the arts. He himself has written, has, is uh, quoted as having benefited from the arts, and it shaped who he was and how he thought. There's no way that you can think outside the box like someone like Steve Jobs can if you're living inside the box all the time with no windows. So, jazz, sax jazz saxophonist John Coltrane, an American icon. 
someone who, unfortunately, in a class of students, I will often mention John Coltrane's name, and no one has heard of him. And yet, he is an American cultural icon. He was known to practice sometimes his instrument for 12 hours a day, seven days a week, through periods in his career. If you think about the amount of time that he spent with the saxophone, and remember, at that time, there was no computers, there was no online learning. If he wanted to listen to something, he had to get a record and put it on and probably wear it out listening to it. Now, what business owner or the, the CEO of an organization, the head of a government organization, would not want their workforce motivated like that? Question, what can a jazz musician teach us about motivation? Where did that motivation come from? If we can identify that, or even part of that, is it something that we can help to teach people, to expose them to, to become inspired by? So maybe John Coltrane can teach us something about that. I'll bet he could also teach us something about flexibility and liquidity, the ability to change rapidly, to, to changing circumstances around you. Moving on, I'm going back in time now. Beethoven, we've all heard of Beethoven classical composer. What can we learn from a composer? Well, what does a composer do? A composer writes music in their head, organizes it, and presents it so that others can hear it, other than inside their head. Beethoven had the additional problem of not being able to hear for part of his career. So he was challenged that way and still had to find a way of putting his music on paper and putting it in a way where other people could understand it. Theme and variations. Beethoven took a simple theme like this. Da 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 da. Da 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 da. How simple is that? There are only a few notes up there. And yet, from that, he was able to come up with a whole symphony. Da 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 but the idea is simple, isn't it? We take something very, very small, a simple idea, and we expand it. We make it bigger and bigger and bigger. Our presenter earlier started with a farm building. <laughs> and look where that ended up. <laughs> okay, and we'll see some more examples of that in a moment. It's an evolving process. We start with a city, a small city, and a hospital comes to the city. And then something else comes to the city. And then the gas industry comes to the city. It's evolving, isn't it? It's a theme and variations. Does this look familiar? Maybe not to some people here. This probably does. <laughs> and this certainly does. Lots of people have those in this room. Theme and variations, a simple idea, something we speak into to communicate. Now we make it better. Now we can dial here instead of having to get the operator. Well, we don't want that anymore. We want to be able to sit anywhere on a train and just tweet away, <laughs> OK? Theme and variations. Another example right here. You can probably guess where that's going. <laughs> Theme and variations. The bottom two share something in common. An internal combustion engine runs on gasoline. And yet those two vehicles are at least, oh, I'm going to say 80 to 90 years apart. Theme and variations. The theme is the internal combustion engine. We'll make it more efficient. We'll make it maybe be able to work on different fuels. We'll make it more powerful. We'll make it more economical. We'll give it more torque so that we can haul something up a hill. Theme and variations, working all the time. And we can learn how, how that happens from, for instance, a composer like Beethoven. So what can a composer teach us about innovation and problem solving? And Beethoven is just one composer from one period. I guarantee that the processes that this composer went through to come up with the product the finished product, were not unlike a lot of the innovations that we're seeing around us today. Symphony orchestra. Large group of people all working together to achieve excellence. They're organized, very carefully organized. In each section is placed in a certain place in the orchestra so that we hear it in a certain way. There is a leadership structure that goes from the conductor the CEO, the governor maybe, scale it down a bit, the mayor perhaps, 
section leaders, the leader of the orchestra, senior management, the next tier down, the section leader, Adolf Herseth, principal trumpet of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra for 50 years. He did a good job. <laughs> and they came to rely on him. And then the sections themselves. A leadership structure there, all working in harmony together, pardon the pun there, but to achieve, hopefully, an exquisite result. Think of other organizations. When you go to see a, a concert at the, uh, at the CAC or somewhere, a large venue where there's a symphony orchestra, nine times out of 10, it's gonna sound pretty good. You're gonna come out of there thinking, that was an excellent performance, that was really good. It's a structure that works together to produce a result. Now think of a company. Think of a company that's successful. It would be the same. The result is very, very good. A company that's not successful will be an orchestra that comes in and falls apart halfway through the second movement because they haven't been rehearsed properly, or the section leaders didn't know what they were supposed to be doing, or the conductor had not led the orchestra in the right way. So there's a correlation between the way organizations are run and the way a symphony orchestra is run. So what can an orchestra, a symphony orchestra, teach us about teamwork? Or what can the duck conductor teach us about leadership? The answer is a great deal. So to summarize, the arts have a very important role to play in our society that goes beyond the obvious. We're seeing it all around us in the city, but unfortunately, it's often done in isolation. It starts in isolation in the school. We have the band, we have the art department, and some administrators, and I'm not saying all like this, but some will only think about it when they need it. Oh, wouldn't it be great to have some music for this event when we're inviting these people in on Saturday? Let's call the band director. He's always there. He'll always send the choir. He'll always send the band. Or let's have some artwork on the walls. So then this add-on, which has not been integrated into the whole curriculum, is called upon to produce, which they always do brilliantly. In the community, the arts are all around us. We see it. We know it's there. We like it to be there. But how many of us have actually thought, can we learn something from these individuals that goes beyond just going to a concert and accepting it is what it is, seeing a painting on a wall? It's a good idea to go a little bit beyond that and think about the artist, the person there. Unfortunately, many artists also work in isolation. Some like to work in isolation. They're not integrating into the community and showing what they do beyond just presenting the end result. There is no involvement in the process that led to the end result. And one of the things I've been trying to do and want to try to continue to do is to make people aware of what they can learn from artists and artists aware that they might be able to teach other people some of the things that they take for granted. So the artist arts community has a little bit of catching up to do as well because artists do tend to be a little bit like this and then they come out to present what they've done and then they go back again. So we can learn a lot from the talented people who dedicate their lives to the arts. This is what I want to leave you with. There may well be people out there that have the solutions to some of our toughest problems without even realizing it. They may not even know that they have the answer. If we can connect the arts with the community beyond just going to a concert and beyond just seeing a painting on a wall, then we might find the answers to some of the solutions, some of the solutions to some of the problems that we're seeking. Thank you very much.